And let's see if we can't finish this, the penultimate chapter of The Revenge of the Wizard's Ghost. Fergie and the Professor unwrapped something that looks like hat pins with stones on them. They have raced back to Dunstan Heights and are now trying to get into the hospital at 3 in the morning where Johnny is. And let's pick up from where the chapter broke off, or the paragraph broke off, I should say. Fergie grinned and nodded. He liked the idea of a mad dash through the hospital at 3 in the morning. It sounded exciting. He got out of the car, closed the door quietly, and followed the professor up the long, curving walk that led toward the main entrance of the hospital. Halfway up the walk, the professor stepped off into the shrubbery that grew nearby. After a quick glance ahead, Fergie saw why he was doing this. The main doors of the hospital were made of glass, and anyone inside could easily see two people who were coming up the walk. Moving as quietly as possible, the two of them shoved their way through fir boughs until they were near the entrance. Then the professor tiptoed forward and cautiously peered in through the glass. The lobby of the hospital was empty, but behind the reception desk, a stern-looking nurse was sitting. She was reading something on a clipboard. "'Is the coast clear?' Fergie whispered. No, it's not, the professor hissed. Have patience. We'll get in somehow. So they waited. After what seemed like hours, the nurse got up, laid the clipboard down, and moved away from the desk. The professor held his breath. He wanted to give the nurse time to get out of the room. Finally, when he was sure she was gone, he motioned for Fergie to follow him. In a few swift strides, they were inside the door. They raced across the lobby toward a white door marked stairs. Up the steps they ran until they emerged into the second-floor corridor. The hospital was deathly still. An electric clock buzzed over a desk that was set in a little alcove. But there was no one there. As Fergie and the professor moved down the hall, their shoes made a squidgy sound on the slick linoleum. They stepped outside the door of room 203. Fergie's heart was pounding, and they were both sweating hard. Quickly, the professor grabbed the knob and opened the door. They both stepped inside. A tiny blue night lamp burned on the wall, and by this faint light they saw Johnny lying in his bed. He was under an oxygen tent, so they couldn't see his face very well, but his limp, pale hands lay on the blanket. The professor moved to the head of the bed, and with trembling hands he peeled back the plastic tent. Johnny looked the way he had the last time the professor saw him. His eyes were closed, and his half-open mouth was curled into an ugly sneer. As Fergie watched, the professor took the jewel case from the inside pocket of his suit coat. He snapped the case open and pulled out the two stick pins. After laying the case down on the edge of the bed, he reached forward and pressed the opal and the two crystal knobs against Johnny's forehead. For a full minute, he held them there while he muttered a prayer. Fergie held his breath and watched. Would it work? Nothing happened. No change came over Johnny. Again, the professor pressed the jewels on Johnny's forehead, and again he prayed, but Johnny still looked the same, and his eyes stayed closed. Oh, my God. The professor breathed. I was afraid of this. We have failed. Are you sure? asked Fergie. Yes, I'm sure. We'd better leave. We've done all we can do. With a sinking heart, the professor folded the tent back down over Johnny. He put the two stick pins back in their case and shoved the case into his pocket. Then, just as he was turning away from the bed, the door of the room opened. There stood the stern, white-haired nurse, the one who had been sitting up at the main desk. For a moment she said nothing. She just stood there with her hand on the knob, staring at the two intruders. Finally she spoke. "'And may I ask,' she said in an sh angry, shocked voice, "'what on earth you two are doing in, the, in this patient's room at three o'clock in the morning?' The professor swallowed hard. He tried to act calm, which was difficult under the circumstances. "'I, we, I mean, my friend and I here, we just returned from a long car trip, and we wanted to see young John Dixon at once.' The professor folded his hands and glanced around nervously. His explanation had not been very good, and he knew it. He braced himself for an outburst of anger. But the nurse stayed calm. She glared at the two of them for a few seconds, and then she motioned for them to step out into the hall. "'I don't know what sort of crazy people you two are,' she said as Fergie and the professor filed past her. "'But I'll tell you one thing. You are very lucky that I'm not going to call the police, but I will call them if you are not out of this building in two minutes. Do I make myself clear?' Fergie nodded. So did the professor. After another hate-filled glance, the nurse stepped back into Johnny's room and shut the door. Fergie and the professor stood there a few seconds longer, then they turned slowly and began to walk away. But they had not taken more than four or five steps when the door of Johnny's room opened again, and the nurse stepped out. 
into the hall. On her face was an awestruck look. Wait! she called. Wait, please! Fergie and the professor turned. What was going to happen to them now? The nurse took a step forward. Are... are you Professor Childermass? she asked in a frightened voice. The professor nodded. Yes, he said stiffly. Why do you ask? Because Johnny's awake and he wants to talk to you. The professor looked totally stunned. He smiled faintly and fiddled with his watch chain. Humph, he said. He does, eh? Well, I'll be glad to talk to him in a second, but... His voice trailed off. Turning away, the professor took two steps down the hall. Then he stopped, putting his hands on his face. He began to sob uncontrollably. It had been a very long day. And that is the end of chapter 14.